And I do, our, my thoughts and prayers go out to Cindy McCain and their family. I have to tell you, I was never involved in politics before. And it was the 2008 campaign of John McCain and Sarah Palin that actually got me to pay attention and how important these issues are. So I, I, every time I, when people ask, how, do you, how did you get involved in politics, I go back to that 2008 campaign and, and John McCain. So it was, the Senate lost a, a really good conservative and uh, he will be missed. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, John McCain, my first exposure to Senator McCain was uh, when I was in junior high. I saw a movie about his life, about him being in the, uh, nor or the uh, North Vietnamese prison camps and what he had to endure. And I was very impressed uh, by the courage and the stamina and the faith of this man. Uh, that's one thing. The second thing I'd like to do is really simple. I would just like to cede the rest of my time here on the microphone uh, and give him a moment of silence, if we could. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah, regardless of, I think everybody here can, you know, at some point or another, maybe had some issues politically with, uh, with Senator McCain, but regardless of your thoughts on him at any given point in time, you can't argue that he was a patriot, that he was uh, lived a life dedicated to service of this country, and uh, he will be missed. So, with that being out of the way, let's do some uh, opening statements. Uh, Jim Newberger, Karen Housie, you guys are running for U.S. Senate. You're the, uh, the endorsed candidates for U.S. Senate. Uh, Jim, you're running against Amy Klobuchar, Karen against uh, Tina Smith. Let's do a quick opening statement, tell people who, a little bit about who you are and uh, what made you decide to run. Sure. Do you want to go first, ladies first? Sure. Thanks. Thanks, Jim. Thanks, Drew. Uh, I am, I'm Karen Housley, again, running for the uh, vacated Al Franken seat. I was born and raised in South St. Paul, ended up marrying my high school sweetheart. Uh, my dad was the, uh, both my parents were public school teachers and my dad was the head basketball coach in South St. Paul. And we had three girls in our family and we had one rule at, the, at my house and it was we weren't allowed to date a hockey player. So I found the cutest hockey player in my, in my small town, Phil Housley, married him. He went on to play 21 years in the NHL and he's now the head coach of the Buffalo Sabres and he's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. I am a small business owner. Uh, I've had a real estate business since 2002. Phil and I have four kids and two grandchildren. And uh, I'm also in the Minnesota State Senate. I serve the area of Stillwater and Forest Lake and I'm the chair of the Aging and Long-Term Care Committee. And I am running against Tina Smith so we can be a new voice for Minnesota. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Uh, I'm Jim Newberger and I live in Becker, Minnesota. I've been married to my best friend for 27 years. We have three grown daughters. Uh, I also serve in the Minnesota state government. I'm a state representative. I'm in my third term in the Minnesota House. I'm the vice chair of the Jobs and Energy Committee. Uh, I've also worked full time as a paramedic for a level one trauma center for 30 years. I just uh, retired from that uh, this year so that I could uh, focus full time uh, on running for this U.S. Senate seat. Uh, Senator Klobuchar, she's been in office for 12 years. 12 years. She wants six more. That's 18 years, folks. 18 years of swamp time. Now, regardless of how you feel about term limits, I think 18 years is too much. I support term limits, and I think it's time for Senator Klobuchar to move on to bigger and better things. That's one. And number two, Senator Klobuchar is chomping at the bit to impeach Donald Trump. That is the number one prize for this midterm election. If the Democrats get control, their very first target is going to be our president, who has worked so hard to make America great. So if you remember two things about Senator Klobuchar, Number one, 18 years. Number two, protect our president because we need to. And if I go, when I go to Washington, I will do just that. I will work with our president to make our nation great. We are, of course, here at the Minnesota State Fair. The fair is uh, very important when it comes to politics and when it comes to campaigning. You know, you got to have a presence. You got to get out and work the fair. You guys have been here quite a bit already. I know you've been out there working. Talk a little bit about what you're hearing from people, because I'm sure you've interacted with people from both sides of the aisle, uh, what is the most prevalent conversation that you're hearing in your conversations here at the fair so far? 
Uh, number one, as I talk to people, they respect our president, they love our president, they know that he's under attack and they want him protected. That is first and foremost. As I speak to people, the very first thing I hear out of their mouths is, do you support President Trump? That's, that's always the icebreaker. My answer is, is absolutely I do, and I always, I always will. Uh, his plan for our country is, is the right path for us to be on. Uh, that is the predominant discussion, and it's a good one to have. We've got to keep that moving forward because we can win Minnesota. We are this close to turning Minnesota red, and when we do that, we'll protect our president. Um, I agree with, with Jim. I'm hearing all of that, too. And, and in addition, one of the things that's at the top of the list is people are so sick and tired of, of politicians, one, and two, the extremism that's happening in Washington, D.C., uh, the, the extreme partisanship, the digging the heels in and not working together. At whatever level of government you elect somebody, whether it's school board or city council or state legislature, you expect them to go there and get things done. Instead, they go there, and, and like Tina Smith, uh, she's a puppet for Chuck Schumer, their leader on the Democrat side, and whatever Chuck said she should do, she does. She votes that way every single time, and she's obstructing all of the good things that could be happening in the, in the U.S. Senate. And that's the one thing that people are sick and tired of, our party line politics, the extremism, and the obstruction of, of good things happening. Jim, you had the opportunity to debate your opponent here at the fair yesterday. Talk a little bit about how that went. Uh, you know, we, we uh, parachuted right into enemy territory. <laughs> yeah, it was, first of all, it started out as MPR, and then uh, Senator Klobuchar just so happened to have her booth right outside the entrance. So we walked into that, and I just went, wow, isn't this convenient? So uh, we did, I thought we did really well. Um, Senator Klobuchar, uh, there's two things I wanted to communicate, uh, because NPR is broadcast around the state. Um, what the Klobuchar people failed to recognize was is they, there's this bubble over the metro. There's this liberal bubble that they kind of live in. And they don't see out, and they don't see past that. They don't see into greater Minnesota. So one of the things that we really tried to do was, uh, number one, is to project the fact that I can go toe-to-toe -to -toe for 15 rounds with Amy Klobuchar, and when we're done, I'll do 100 push-ups and I'll do 15 more rounds because it's, I love doing that. I'm not afraid of her, and I'll, I'll brain-wrestle her any day. Uh, that was number one. And number two is I wanted the, the message to get put out, especially to greater Minnesota, that I support our president because she most clearly does not. Right. It's, it's got to be tough. I mean, it's a unique challenge. You both face very different challenges in your respective races, despite you're both running for Senate, both running statewide campaigns. Jim, you're facing a, an incumbent uh, a senator who enjoys, you know, ranked the most popular elected official in the entire state. So you've got that challenge to overcome, whereas, and she's got a track record that you can, uh, that you can run on or run against. Uh, whereas you, you know, you're running against somebody who's never been elected to anything and doesn't have much of a legislative track record. Talk a little bit, uh, Karen, we'll start with you. Talk a little bit about the challenges that presents running against someone who is a bit of a blank slate, when, at least legislatively, when it comes to voting record. Um, and... and Voting record, yes, except her voting, Tina Smith's voting record in Washington, D.C. right now is to continue to obstruct anything that uh, the president tries to do or that the Republicans try to do. Even when it comes to uh, Pre President Trump's nominee, Brett Kavanaugh, she's right out of the gate, has a, rail, or a protest right outside. With, before they had even named who the nominee was, Tina Smith has a, a big protest rally to say she's going to obstruct it and she's going to vote no. Um, but Tina Smith does have a record. She's, a, she's been a political operative her whole career. Uh, she was lieutenant governor for Governor Dayton for three years. She was his chief of staff for four years before that. Before that, she was chief of staff for the mayor of Minneapolis, Mayor Ryback. And before that, she was vice president of Planned Parenthood. So she has a lot that she needs to be held accountable for. All of the failures of the Dayton Smith administration, whether it was taking care of our seniors, which was my passion, which is the reason I decided to run for this seat, is because Tina Smith failed to take care of our elder population when they were being abused in nursing homes. She didn't stand up for them. And then the failures of Minsher, uh, Min Lars, there's a long, long list of failures of Tina Smith. So even though she didn't have a voting record, she needs to be held accountable of, of her leadership that she failed at. So it's going to be easy to run against Tina Smith. And you've got, you know, like you said, uh, like I said, the, the, the popularity of Amy Klobuchar mm -hmm. in and of itself is a big challenge. How do you, how do you overcome that? Well, how do you message against somebody who, 
you know, we call her, we jokingly on the show call her the senator of small things because she doesn't, <laughs> she doesn't put herself out there in any real controversial way. Anytime mm -hmm. you're going to see a quote from Amy Klobuchar in the paper, it's always on a very benign issue. So. Right. Um, uh, Drew, you touched on a, a really good topic. Uh, senator Klobuchar, who she is in Washington, D.C., and who she is at home are two different people, uh, two different total things. Uh, number one, when it comes to the nice factor, I've been addressing this for 14 months. Uh, Senator Klobuchar will come home, she'll do all of the nice things. I tell people, I've been saying this for a long time, she stands in the cornfield, gets the, uh, the photo op, pats the kid on the head, uh, does the little hot dish things, and everyone loves it, and she smiles, and everyone thinks that's great. Then she goes back to Washington, D.C., and, and for the last 12 years, she has a 90%, 90% rubber stamp voting record with the extreme progressive left. How she votes in D.C. and who she is at home are two different things. And on top of that, she was ranked as the worst boss in Washington, D.C. by Politico. That's Politico. It's a media outlet out of D.C. And they, they don't do this subjectively. It's not just, well, we think she's bad, we don't like her. That's not how it's done at all. They rank everyone in D.C. by the number of people that quit who work for her, and they only count senior level staff. They don't count entry level people because that's generally a revolving door uh, for folks trying to work their way up. Senior level staff only. She was ranked in 2017, just last year, as the worst boss to work for in Washington, D.C. Who she is in D.C. and who she is at home, two totally different things. Yeah, the public persona doesn't necessarily match what you hear uh, behind the scenes. And uh, I'm calling her out on it. Good, you should. Uh, given the challenges that Republicans have had with statewide elections over the last several cycles, uh, what do you think are some of the key differences right now in 2018 that give you guys a better chance than in previous cycles? Karen, you want to be here? Go ahead. Uh, right now, the biggest chance that we, or the biggest difference right now, we have never seen a period in our history, in my, uh, in my memory or talking to people who have been around longer than me and their memories, we are this close. We are this close to becoming a red state. And we can do this. We can absolutely do this. There, there has never been, nor will there ever be, in my opinion, a time where we can do this. Donald Trump came within one and a half points of winning Minnesota just two years ago. One and a half points. He won substantially in five of the eight congressional districts. People love his message. And you know what? We can do this. We can carry this forward. Folks, are the, the DFL party, the longer they exist, the more far and extreme they become. Uh, the, I grew up in a Democrat blue-collar family. That's how, we, that's how I grew up. And I left, I left, I became a Republican because they you left me. did a hashtag me. walk away. Oh, they did. They left me. And most Minnesotans are finding that this is the case that the Democrat Party doesn't stand for democracy, it stands for neo-socialism. They certainly don't stand for farms, and they certainly don't stand for labor. What they stand for is anyone's guess, and most people are starting to realize that. Uh, hashtag walk away here, too. I, uh, I grew up as a Democrat, both my husband and I, with the parents who were in the union, and they've left the unions, too, Jim. Uh, and, and, and like Jim said, it's... President Trump lost Minnesota by 40,000 votes. We were one of a few states who had Evan McMullen on the ballot, and he took 54,000 of our Republican votes. So that alone, President, would have, would have won Minnesota. Gary Johnson took 150,000 votes as an independent. So this state was, we were right there. Uh, and, and you do feel it. Uh, just like in 2016 when none of us real I mean, there's a few here that would say, I knew President Trump was going to win, but it wasn't until the rally um, at Sun Country uh, hangar that I really thought that the president, it, this could actually happen. Um, so when he came to Duluth uh, uh, two months ago and did the rally up there, I thought, well, I'm going to go up there and see what the temperature is on the ground for Trump now, because according to the mainstream media, there's this huge blue wave coming. It was absolutely the opposite. There was so much energy and excitement in that room. It was like Sun Country Hangar on steroids in Duluth that day. People stood in line in that 95 degree humid day in Duluth, which <laughs> there was one day all, all last 10 years and this was it, to, to uh, just see uh, Air Force One land and take off. So there is so much excitement. It's not just President Trump, but for, uh, 
for our message. For the, the economy has never been better. Unemployment is at its lowest in 18 years. People have jobs. People are keeping more of their hard-earned dollars in their pocket. Uh, my little sister, who is a Democrat, I was just telling you, um, but she, and she's still so upset that, that Hillary Clinton lost the election. And she always says, your president, Karin, your president. But she's finally come around. She's a single mother of three kids, and she didn't have a job for a long time. She now has a really good job, and she's keeping more of her, her hard-earned tax dollars in her pocket. And she said, okay, I don't have to love the president, but what he is doing is really, really working. And that's exactly what's happening, and you hear it throughout Minnesota. People just aren't as vocal as, as the Democrats are. And like Jim was also saying, that, and you hear this especially when you get to, to uh, greater Minnesota, um, the, the Democrat Party that my dad was part of is no longer that same Democrat Party. They have, they have left the Democrats, I, and I, I'm surprised we haven't seen senators up in the 8th District flip parties because they are not they are not the Democrat Party anymore. Yeah, the loudest voices don't always represent the majority and I think when it comes to the uh, the antipathy towards uh, towards Trump, I think that's a good example. You may have some very loud voices out there, but they don't necessarily represent the majority of people. The bottom line is results matter. And I think people from both sides of the aisle are seeing the results of the Trump administration so far. Uh, with that being said, we were talking a little bit earlier about what you're hearing in conversations at the fair. I'd be curious to know what you're hearing specifically from people that maybe not be, might not be supporters of your campaigns, you know, might be on the other side of the aisle. Do you have, have you had any conversations with, uh, with people from the other side of the aisle where you see opportunities for some common ground? Right. Um, th th that's an excellent question because as we move forward and as I'm speaking with people, one of the things that comes up is this general disgust for the treat treatment of women. Uh, Senator Klobuchar has come out and she has said that uh, you know, she is the first woman uh, to be elected to the U.S. Senate uh, in Minnesota history. And you know what? I'm very proud of that and she should be proud of that because that's a milestone. But she, doesn't, she didn't carry that forward. And as I'm talking to people, as we see these, uh, these issues unfold for women, especially for women, uh, number one, um, the, uh, we had an opportunity, we had a historic opportunity just this year where the very first woman was going to be nominated to head the CIA. Very first. It's never happened before. Senator Klobuchar voted against that. She voted no. The first woman senator from Minnesota voted no against the first woman CIA director. Then you move forward to the Al Franken debacle. Senator Klobuchar backed him, not only did she back him up, but she's still backing him up for all of the things that he did to make him step down and resign from a U.S. Senate seat. And then the third and most egregious thing that people are, the conversations that we're having as we're moving forward with this, is the whole Keith Ellison factor. Now, the National Organization for Women, one of our you know, political arch enemies, has publicly called for Keith Ellison to step out of the race, has publicly called for him to step out due to the allegations of abuse and what seems to be unfolding before us. And you know what, Senator Klobuchar has had no comment. She will not step forward and she will not do the right thing. So the whole women's issues uh, topic, that's really critical and it's popping up because it's in the news. And folks, I've got three grown daughters. This is very important to me. And this is what's coming up. This is what we're hearing from Minnesotans. She's a do-nothing senator and she's gonna do nothing about this issue. Um. I have three grown daughters, too, and one of them is here, but I can't find her anywhere. Oh, there she is. There's Avery. Uh, she just got home from, uh, she's been gone all summer long, and I said, you got to get to the fair and help me out. Wear my shirt. Um, I'm hearing the exact same thing, the woman issue, and, and it must be their whole mantra with what, what the accusations against Keith Ellison. Anything that's, anything that's really serious that you want them to comment on, uh, the Democrats go underground, and they, they, they're, the Keith Ellison's accusations were serious, and Tina Smith said absolutely nothing to, about them. Um, and secondly, what I'm, I, I've had a booth at the Washington County Fair for seven years um, in my, for my state senate. Uh, that's my state senate booth. Um, and straight across from mine is the DFL booth, and it's been there for seven years, and, and I've become friends with those guys uh, to a point. <laughs> they haven't voted for me, but this year... Uh, the last day of the Washington County Fair, the guy who runs that booth came over to me and he said, Karin, I can't believe I'm going to say this, but this is going to be the first year ever in my life that I'm voting Republican. Be you, yeah, we hear that a lot. Yep. 
He said he was, he's just, he can't believe how far left and extreme and socialist that the Democrats have become with the uh, open borders, not protecting our own people here, finding out who we are, keeping us safe. He's absolutely disgusted with, with where the Democrat party, and yeah, we hear a lot of Democrats, even a couple at my booth over here, they're like, well, we are Democrat, but we can't vote, vote Democrat. So tell us about your party. Yeah, so it's interesting. So much for the blue wave. That's right. So much yeah. for the blue wave is yeah. right. You were one of the first to step out and call out your opponent for their support of Ellison. Uh, you actually came on our show and you issued out some press releases uh, because Tina Smith had endorsed Keith Ellison for Attorney General. Uh, Mark Dayton has endorsed Keith Ellison for Attorney General. Several high-profile DFLers have endorsed and they have not spoken nor withdrawn those endorsements uh, with the domestic abuse allegations out there. Uh, since that, since you, you made that statement, have you gotten any response from the Smith camp and, uh, and have you heard from constituents about that issue? Um, I haven't heard anything from Tina Smith and you're right, I, I came out and, and that was the story that, ooh, they really got upset about. They, they were all in a tizzy because we were actually calling out the Democrats to just make a statement. These are the accusations. Could you make a statement on it? No, I haven't heard anything from Tina Smith on that. And she continues to support him, although it's very interesting because she had uh, Keith Ellison, her good friend Keith Ellison, on the front page of her website. Um, she has since taken that down, and he's now buried a few pages later. Uh, but that is, and that's what's really what you hear from, from moderate Democrats is that's not the party that they are. And she's been on the stage with Keith Ellison and Bernie Sanders, arm in arm, um, and this is the party, the metrocentric socialist party that they have become. So that's what you're hearing. The, the Democrats that, that have always voted Democrat, that's not who they are anymore. And so, they're, so everybody that's out there today, make sure that you just tell them a little bit about what we stand for and the good things that are happening because they need to hear it because they're, they're ripe to move. They just need to continue to hear it from us. Both of you, uh, before we get into sp some specific issues, because I want to give you a chance and an opportunity to talk about some key issues, uh, just talk a little bit about the challenges of running a, a statewide campaign. Um, how do you balance that with, you both have families, you both have uh, life in the private sector. Uh, talk a little bit about the challenges and, and, and what you've learned uh, being on the trail on a statewide basis. Drink a lot of coffee. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, the biggest challenges, I would have to say, uh, when I first got into this race uh, 14 months ago, um, for about the first three weeks, uh, I, would, I would finish my day and I would say to myself, I can't do this. The pace is just too much. But then you get used to the pace. And it's kind of like a, a marathon runner. Once you get used to running you know, a 5K or, a, or a, full, a full marathon or a half marathon, you get used to that pace. So now I'm used to this pace. Um, and it's very, I, I think I've had one day off in the last year. I might have had one. But if you get a half a day off or a, a day off, you don't know what to do with yourself because you're so used to going at 100 miles an hour. Uh, the challenge is getting into what I call campaign shape. But once you get there, you can do it. But you, the most important thing is having uh, your family support you. Uh, I could not do this if my wife and, and my grown daughters weren't behind me 120% and they are. Um, I'm very blessed to have that. Um, but I look forward to this. We got, what, 73 days left? Yeah, look out, because we're really going to hit warp nine. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I, I've always been a faith first, family second, career third. And if, as long as you keep your priorities uh, in order like that, everything else can fall into place. That being said, you're doing it running 100 miles per hour. Um, and, and it's... Putting together a really good team, I didn't get in until uh, end of December, beginning of January. And you have to make sure that from the top down, you're working as hard as you can so the people on your campaign team also are working as hard. And I feel bad for them because they're all wearing eight different hats, whether they're a photographer or a parade organizer or extra fun. provided fundraiser. them with some nice shirts. They get nice shirts. Yeah. They get nice shirts. That's the, that's the perk of being part of a campaign. Um, and, uh, but it is. It is. It is. Everybody wants a piece of you, any part of the state. Why haven't you come out to Alexandria? Why haven't you been up to Thief River? Why aren't you? And there's, there's parades every weekend, multiple parades, and there's only one of us. Um, and then that on top of it, you have these things cost a lot of money. They cost a lot of money, so you're constantly, every time I'm on, in the car, 
I have a driver, um, but I'm on the phone fundraising, fundraising, fundraising. So it's, you want to get your message out to every single person out there. Um, still, you know, get to church. I was actually at church this morning at uh, Ojibwe Park in Woodbury before the parade. Um, and, and then make sure you take care of your family. I was telling Drew earlier that my son-in-law has been in the hospital for two and a half weeks. Um, his appendix ruptured. There's major mom guilt here that I'm not taking care of the grandkids all of the time. But it's, it's, the, if the family is supporting you, which they are, it makes everything a lot easier. Yeah, and you, thanks for the, your prayers for those of you who have been following on Twitter. You've got you to gotta have that support from the, from the family, you know, the, the extended family especially. It really makes a difference. All right, let's get into some of the, uh, the key issues. Uh, that you're going to be uh, facing and talking about this election and uh, where you stand and how you differentiate from your opponents. We'll start with uh, health care. Uh, what's the federal government's role in health care and what can the federal government do and what can you do as a member of the Senate to help out Minnesota and Minnesotans with, uh, with their health care issues? Well, one, and, uh, and this is just about everything the government can get out of the way, um, we had a, a pretty good health care system here in Minnesota before the Obamacare came in, and then we added an extra layer of government on top of that, an extra layer of bureaucracy, Minsure, um, and that we can blame Tina Smith for. Uh, we're just going to say Tina Smith from now on. We're just going to blame Tina Smith for that. An extra cost. I mean, and you're out there. We're out there, and you're talking to uh, my kids, uh, the farmers, people throughout Minnesota, their, their uh, health care costs have doubled and tripled because they think a uh, government-run health care system is the answer, and it's not the answer. And now, even though we've been saying it, we had been saying it for eight years, it wasn't the answer, it's not going to work. And they kept saying it was going to work. It didn't work. It was a complete failure, so we need to repeal and replace Obamacare. And the way that we do that is we need to be able to... We have priority making health insurance more affordable, and to do that, we should be able to buy health insurance across uh, state lines like we do our car insurance. My 21-year-old daughter doesn't need, she's not 21 yet, doesn't need the same uh, health insurance that you know, my husband at 55 needs. So we, we need to, we need to uh, open it up to a uh, competitive market, because the only way we're going to bring the cost down is to really, really uh, make it a competitive market. I would echo a lot of what uh, Senator Housley has said here. Um, we, have to, uh, we have to permanently get rid of Obamacare. Now, we've, we've made a step forward uh, by getting rid of, uh, ladies and gentlemen, Representative Jeremy Munson of the RFL. <laughs> Everyone say hi. Sorry about that. You always shout them out when you see them. Um, we have to get rid of Obamacare permanently. We need a permanent fix, and a permanent fix starts with getting rid of that. We, do, we did get rid of the uh, individual mandate, which was good, uh, but we need to go forward. We need to put this thing in its grave forever. We need to go back to a free market or open up a better free market solution. Uh, in the past, when we had a free market, a sort of a free market uh, arena where we had five major providers, we need to open this up across state lines because competition lowers price and increases quality. And then the final step is that what we need to do is we need to bring back our old model or something similar of Minnesota care. It was the model for the nation because one of the things uh, that gets thrown in our face is what about all of the people that are exceedingly vulnerable, all of the people that cannot take care of themselves, that are genuinely uh, unable to do so. Minnesota care was the model for the nation. And we bring that back as a safety net, and we open up the free market. And you know what? We can turn this thing around. We can absolutely turn this around. One final caveat that I'll put in this. Uh, when, right before Obamacare became the law of the land, uh, they were taking some of the final votes, some of the final amendment votes uh, in the Senate uh, to get this thing done and to get it passed so that Obama would sign this into law. There was an amendment that was offered that simply said, if your state if your state is already doing a good job of take care, taking care of its people, you as a state may opt out. You can say, you know what, we don't want to go the big Obamacare route. We don't want the big government, big bureau, bureau, bureaucratic route. We can do it ourselves. Senator Klobuchar voted no against that amendment. She decided herself, she took it upon herself and decided by herself for five and a half million people that the government should take care of your health care and not leave it like we had it. And let's not forget that uh, Governor Dayton uh, and, and, and Tina Smith uh, opted to sort of lead the way into, a, into embracing right. the Affordable Care Act, into embracing Obamacare, right. and uh, that led to the Minshore debacle. Well, that the, the website for four, uh, now almost $400 million, a website for $400 million that doesn't work. Yeah. You know what, folks? I give you $10 million and say go build a website. 
I'll build 10. Yeah, you'll build 10 and you'll still do well. <laughs> uh, let's move on to uh, immigration. Uh, immigration, obviously, is something that, uh, that is a hallmark of the, uh, of the Trump administration, of the Trump campaign. Um, do you support the idea of a border wall, and, uh, and, and what do you think should happen to, to those that are, uh, that are protected under the, uh, the DACA program? Mm -hmm. um, I, I am a, a granddaughter of a uh, Yugoslavian immigrant. He came from Yugoslavia to South St. Paul to work in the meatpacking plants. We actually, all of us here are, are a first generation, second generation, third generation immigrant. It's not that we are against immigrants. We welcome them to our country. We just need to know who's here. You see the incident that happened in Iowa um, with Molly Tibbetts being murdered by an illegal immigrant? We can't let that happen. We need to, we need to secure our borders. It's, it's a major priority, and we are hearing it from people out there. Besides healthcare, jobs, the economy, it's immigration. And, and we need to know who's here, and it's, it's uh, not that we don't want them. Because on the flip side of that, you will hear from the farmers, every single industry right now in Minnesota and across the country are looking for workers. We want them to come, but we just want them to come here legally. And I don't think there's anything wrong. I'm still trying to figure out when the Democrats come up to my booth. I'm like, well, what part of this am I not understanding? Because I'm telling you, the Democrats, both Amy Klobuchar and Tina Smith, are all for open borders. Just let them all in. And we cannot have that. Otherwise, we are not a country. And as for the DACA, uh, 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 people here in, in the United States. I think we do have to set up some sort of framework because they didn't come here, uh, they came here uh, as kids and they now are, are living or and working. Here. Yeah, or are brought here, right. And, uh, and, and they're paying taxes, so we've gotta, we've gotta set up some sort of framework, which, and this is the thing that's so irritating. There have been so many bills in Congress that have provided a framework for them to be here. And the Democrats want to make this an issue in this election. It could have been taken care of, and, and Trump actually went farther than a lot of people wanted him to in his framework in allowing them to stay here, and uh, the Democrats obstructed the whole kit and caboodle. So that's who they are. They say this is their number one priority, yet they're not doing anything about it. Thank you. Hey, that's an excellent question. Um, first and foremost, the Democrat Party wants to turn Minnesota into a sanctuary state. There is no doubt about that, that Tim Walls, that is his goal. Folks, I don't know about you, but I know that I do not support that. Not at all, number one. Number two, um, we have to build this wall. We have to finish the wall. We have to finish the funding for it because the first way you secure your nation is you secure your borders. That's paramount. As far as the DACA people are concerned, and I brought this up when we were at uh, the NPR uh, debate uh, two days ago. The DACA people, it's a, to me, it's a simple answer. Number one, they were brought here by their parents who knowingly broke the law. Their parents violated American law and brought their children here illegally. Now, it's not their fault that they're here, but it doesn't change the fact that their parents broke the law. And these people, by, according to the law, should not be citizens. Now, can we round them all up and send them back to wherever they came from? That would be impossible. It will not happen. For people that love that idea, I say to you, it's not you just can't do that. It is physically impossible. So my solution is simple. Offer these people permanent resident alien status. You're not citizens. You were brought here illegally. We're not going to ship you home. If you're producing, you're, you're contributing, if you consider America to be your home ground, then we will give you permanent resident alien status. That's, I think, is as far as we should go at this point. Uh, there's more to it, but in the here and now over the next year, I think that those are the steps we need to take. Let's talk a little bit about uh, the trade situation and the tariffs. Where do you guys stand on the president's tactics, let's say, of using tariffs to try to negotiate better trade deals for the United States? Um, I'll, be, I'll be quick here. <laughs> uh, um, most of our trade deals with our foreign, uh, with our, our foreign trade partners have been very one-sided. They've been very lopsided. America has always gotten more, uh, more of the stick uh, than anything else. Uh, I think President Trump, who is the master of the deal, 
has, has done the right thing by imposing these tariffs. It has turned around our steel industry. It has jump-started the economy up on the Iron Range. Now, one of the things that came forward, and we knew this would happen, would be retaliatory tariffs, especially from the Chinese, from what they import, especially with our agricultural community, our farm community. We need to go back to the table, and we need to sit down with the Mexicans, we need to sit down with the Canadians, and we need to sit down with the Chinese, and we cannot sever those trade relationships, because they took decades to build. But what we need to do is we need to get back and we need to renegotiate a trade deal for agriculture, and it has to be done before harvest. I spoke to the farmers last week at FarmFest, and they are very fearful that we could be facing another 1980s farm crisis. And folks, if that happens, we're in trouble. So we need to go back and renegotiate this. Now there's one small tidbit that most people on this side of the Pacific uh, in the U.S. Don't, don't seem to understand is that China has too many people. They cannot feed all of their population. It is physically impossible for them to do that. China must import food to feed its population. They are over a barrel right now. They need our agricultural exports. So I think we've got the upper hand. I think that the Trump administration will do a good job, but we've got to do something with the agricultural tariffs. It's paramount. That was you being short. That was you being short. <laughs> brief. <laughs> brief, brief, brief. I'm short, you're brief. <laughs> um, you know what, it, it, this president does uh, negotiate things uh, much differently than we've ever seen, and he's a little bit tougher. Uh, but he's the, the uh, magician of the art of the deal. Um, it's a little tough, his style, he goes, away, uh, goes about doing it. But as he's shown since he's been in office, he's done what he says he's going to do, and this is one of the issues. And now finally, the farmers' issues are at the forefront. They, it's been an unfair trade deal for years and years and years. It's been unfair and the farmers are the ones who have been losing. And we were at Farm Fest a couple weeks ago and, and they, they're willing to be patient. They would like him to get this done sooner rather than later, but they're, even the soybean farmers who are, that's who it's really hitting hard, um, but they, they know that through this, this cycle they've already lost it, but they are, they're continuing to pray for the president and hope that he gets this done sooner rather than later. Um, Oh, there was one more thing that I wanted to say about the trade. Oh, so, like he was saying with China, so the president's already got the EU and they're talking and then he's going to get Mexico, so then you get Mexico and us and then you get Canada and then we can put pressure on China. But there's pressure coming from China from within, which just right now, like he said, they are the largest uh, um, uh, needing our agriculture, uh, largest country that needs it. Well, they are, they are the number one um, buyers of our pork. Because now, in addition to that, they've got a swine flu happening over there. And it's just been, I was talking to the pork producers here two days ago at the fair, and he was flying over to China, and it could wipe out their herd. So it's even going to put more pressure on them. I know. Go, I, I wasn't aware it, of that. I know. And yeah. so that is, it's going to put more pressure on them to really get this thing done. So China has issues happening within. President Trump, Trump is a tough talker. Um, but he gets things done the, in, in only the way he can. <laughs> and uh, one more issue, probably the most pressing issue, I think, facing this election, and really the one that's going to determine whether or not I can support you guys as candidates. Oh. Where do you stand on Space Force? <laughs> on Space Force. You know I need what? to know let's, where you stand, you stand on, Space on Space Force. 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 Um, you know, let's get them out there. Let's get that's them. Right. I, I love when Jimmy Kimmel or, or uh, <laughs> uh, Jimmy Fallon, and then people actually go, well, I think... <laughs> So you want to give your answer on Space Force? Yeah, we, come on. It's crucial. It's it crucial. is crucial. Let's get them. Let's, let's uh, round up the troops and raise some money and get, them, get our Space Force out there. People joke, but the truth is that China and Russia already have sort of militarized a lot of their, their, uh, their, their, their space? space programs. Um, and we are kind of behind the eight ball on it. You know, it's kind of funny to call it Space Force. And, and there's, there's certainly some room for some joke in there. But it is a real issue, you know, when it comes to protecting our satellites and protecting our communications. Uh, actually, you're right. And we do need to have a separate branch of the military called Space Force. And most people imagine, you know, something along the, you know, the Star Trek or the Star Wars line. Um, you know, that's generations away. Uh, the initial phases of a Space Force would basically be uh, automated satellites. That are, that are designed specifically uh, for defense. Uh, right now, if you look at a lot of our computer hacking, you look at a lot of our cyber warfare, you look at a lot of the intrusive uh, behavior by foreign countries, most of it's coming from satellites from outer space. 
That's how they do it. They've got, we've got satellites in space from all different nations that are extremely complex, very high technology, and if we develop a space force, uh, because you know what, folks, if we go into combat, God forbid we, we go into another war, uh, the majority of our intelligence and the majority of our command and control takes place from space satellites. And if we can knock out satellites, then we've got a leg up. It used to be, if you can control the airspace, you can control the war. Now it's you've got to be able to control the satellite space. So we have to be able, for, if that's the threat of the 21st century, then we need to be prepared to step forward for yeah, that. Yeah, it really is. And it's, it goes beyond that. I mean, it's just the way we communicate with each other. Right. So much of it's done uh, via satellite right. uh, and, and global uh, GPS units, things like that. If those things get disrupted, it can cause a lot of problems. Yeah. Um, the Senate has been kind of uh, in the last couple of years, and really longer than that, uh, it's been the place where bills go to die. Uh, there's been a lot of obstruction happening in the Senate, even with you know a Republican majority there. Uh, we were coming off of two years of one of the most productive uh, House sessions in, in, in a very long time. The House has done a great job passing a lot of bills and trying to advance the president's agenda, but a lot of it has just gone to sort of die in the Senate, and a lot of that is due to the uh, ability of having a filibuster-proof majority. Uh, there's been some calls to get rid of that rule, uh, get rid of the filibuster rule, where you know a simple majority can get a lot of uh, a lot of bills through. Where do you guys stand on that? Is that something that you would support in the Senate? I support that. Uh, I think that uh, you are correct, uh, and I'm just going to reiterate what you said here. Uh, we have. Thank you. Um, we have so much uh, that we have done, we've accomplished, that President Trump wants to do. We get it through the House with flying colors. And again, it goes to the Senate, where generally there's been a handful of senators who have, who have basically shut the whole process down. Uh, and it's based on this, this filibuster rule. Get rid of it, because America can be great again. And one of the things that's slowing us up, that's holding us back, is this, this whole procedural process uh, that the Senate's doing to slow things down. I agree with Jim, and I think there are over 600 bills that, that are sitting at the floor of the Senate that they can't even get a hearing on because they know that, that it would go nowhere. It's a waste of time. Yeah. Right, it's a waste of time. So, uh, so it, uh, I, I do agree that we've got we've got and, and in the Minnesota Senate, um, there's only certain bills that need to have a supermajority, and I, I wouldn't be opposed to that, but maybe not every single bill, but... but it, if you have the majority, you have the majority, and then you should be able to pass a bill. Bottom line is it's just a rule. It's not in the Constitution. It's not codified by any law. It's just a, right. a Senate rule and a Senate procedure, right. and there's no reason that it can't be done away with. Uh, the other thing that has to be done as far as Senate procedural rules is that the Senate Majority Leader, uh, there's a fixed amount of amendments that they will hear on a given bill, and the Senate Majority Leader gets to decide which amendments are heard. And what they generally do to block senators is the Majority Leader, I believe it's called uh, loading the Christmas tree uh, or stacking the deck, uh, what they will do is the Senate Majority Leader will stack all of his or her amendments or the people that they are in close cahoots with uh, they'll put them all in, into the hopper so that if you've got a really good amendment as a, just a run-of-the-mill senator, uh, good luck. You can't do that. Uh, what needs to happen is they need to get rid of that rule so that amendments, uh, like we have in the House, uh, you can have unlimited amendments. Uh, if you've got a good amendment, it should be heard. It shouldn't be blocked by your majority leader who's holding that over your head as leverage. Um, we are just about out of time with this. Uh, we're going to give you guys an opportunity if there are any issues that we didn't touch on that, uh, that you want to hit on and uh, offer up a closing statement as well. We'll give you guys each a couple of minutes. Thanks, Drew. Uh, oh, hi. <laughs> I don't think he's taking questions because we have a... a, a we got a heart out here. Um, anyway, so I do want to thank everybody for coming. Uh, I am Karin Housley running for the United States Senate. I really have a hard close. Sorry, sir. Um, and... Okay, when I get out. Let us wrap um, up here. And uh, we have our booth here at the Minnesota Fair over on um, Wright and Cosgrove. We have our booth there, so I would love for everybody to come by. You can get a little fan, a senator on a stick. You can hashtag senator on a stick, and uh, we're giving away prizes at our booth. Um, but we'd love to have you come over there and get your picture. But thank you so much for coming today, Karen Housley, running for the U.S. Senate for the seat that was vacated by Al Franken. Yes. The, uh, the final issue, again, I'm Jim, New I'm sorry.
go ahead. <laughs> the final issue I want to touch on uh, that we haven't touched on uh, is refugee resettlement, uh, that whole program. Uh, I am a strong advocate of shutting that program down. We need to shut that program down until we can fix it. Uh, one of the things that makes our nation great is that we reach out to refugees and we help them, and we should do that. We did that for the Vietnamese, uh, the boat people, uh, the Southeast Asians. We did that for the Cubans. We did that for the Russians, uh, the, or from the folks from when the Soviet Union broke up. But right now, we have a current group of refugees that are being brought to the United States, predominantly from the Middle East. And some, not all, some, do not want to live under American law. They want to live under a different form of law that says women are property. Folks, I live really close to St. Cloud and I, I encounter this issue weekly. What we need to do is we need to shut down this program and we, need to, we don't start it back up until we fix it. And we make sure that number one, that the communities that these refugees are being brought into have a say in the matter, that it's not an undue financial burden, but most of all that the people that we are bringing here are agreeing to live under American law and only American law. I don't care who you are, thank you. I don't care what you look like. I don't care where you're from. If you come to America, come here legally and come here to live under our law. If you do, welcome. You are just as American as me. But if you're coming here to live under a different form of law, keep looking because America is not the place for you. Yeah. Well, let's then give out your websites if people want to learn more about your campaigns and possibly donate, 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 donate. 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 That's right. Every, and actually, Every five dollars, ten dollars, fifteen dollars, it's it's it'll go straight to voter contact. So, uh, whether it's airs up air uh, commercials up on the air or on the radio or digital Facebook ads, Google radio. ads, and and did I say radio? You did. You did say. Radio. Yeah, yeah, it is. I was on yeah, there. That's right. I, I advertised on you guys. Everybody who advertised on our show won. I just <laughs> want to put that out there. <laughs> I didn't forget about you, Drew. Uh, HowsleyForSenate.com. Thank you so much. And I want to thank all the volunteers in here. And Senator Paul Utke is out there. He, uh, he's the tall guy in the red vest. So uh, he's my, he's my uh, Senate colleague from Park Rapids. So I want to thank everybody for coming and all the volunteers here at the GOP booth. HowsleyForSenate.com. And uh, my website is just Jim4, that's F-O-R, USSenate.com. Jim for US Senate.com. I want to say thank you again for all of the volunteers. Uh, you're the, you're, you are the gas for this tank. You're the ones that make all of this go. And I especially want to thank the volunteers. Uh, some of them are here for my campaign. Um, without you, we wouldn't be here. So God bless you. Enjoy the fair. Get something on a stick and have a good time. And one last round of applause for our next Republican members of the US Senate Jim Newberger, Karen Housley. Round of applause to everybody here working the booth. Fantastic job. The booth looks amazing, and you guys are all working very hard. Uh, thank you for having me. My name is Drew. Once again, Justice and Drew, Monday through Friday, 6 to 9, Twin Cities News Talk, AM 1130. I hope you'll check the show out. Have a great time, everybody.